Every time you say the word whatever, you're not making a decision, which means you're probably not going to get what you want. And when you say whatever, you also look like a slacker or a stoner or a loser. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Ramped Podcast. Today, I am graced with the world famous Rich Moran. Rich, welcome to the show. I don't know about world famous, but I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Danny. Of course, of course. Well, we are honored that you're here. We looked at your background. We've been at admirers from afar for quite some time, and I'm excited to dive in on several topics today, including your perspective on what's actually happening in the job market. But before we jump into all of that, I do want to ask, who is Rich Moran? Wow, that's a big, complicated question. Okay, he is a uh, father, husband, family guy. He is a guy who likes to be really busy. He is a guy who is diverse in his interests. I was once known as the guy on the Dos Equis commercial, you know, stay thirsty, my friend. But I was also known at one time as Amish man, as in the guy who just could not figure out technology. So I'm a lucky guy. I am happy to be healthy and optimistic and here with you today, Danny. Well, Rich, I really appreciate that. That's a great intro. We've noticed that as well over here. Your name is on nearly everything that we could find, books, media, investments, helping young people at school. I mean, it's everywhere. So busy, I think, would be an understatement, and we're excited to dive in a little bit. I'll ask to start off, what are you busy with today? What is top of mind for you? Well, as you know, I have a new book out, Never Say Whatever. And and I tell people, you know, it's with a major publisher, McGraw-Hill, and it's a great book. And it's harder to sell a book than it is to write a book because there's so many great books out there right now. But I am working on getting that book out there, making sure everybody knows about it. I'm also on several boards. I'm on the board of an AI company. I'm on the board of an apparel company. I'm an advisor to a drug delivery company. It's funny because once you're in venture capital, you're always in venture capital because people just send you deals. And I am fascinated by the ideas and the deals that people send me. It's everything from crazy apps to world-changing technology. And I look at them all. They're all interesting. It's the future. I like to look at the future. So I'm still in venture capital. Our family owns a winery as well. So there's that and the books and life is good. You know, it's one thing I want to remind your listeners that The Harvard study on happiness is just out there and it's crazy getting so popular and where they followed people, Harvard graduates from the 1938 through their lives about what makes them happy. And without a doubt, what makes people happy in their lives are relationships, not accomplishments, not money, not new cars. And so the study really struck me as something to continue working on relationships and being never too old to make new friends. So you're my new friend now, Danny. I love that and I'm honored. And yes, the thread I want to pull on, I think, throughout this episode is the relationship piece as ramped. What we're offering to folks is obviously a job skilling or job discovery platform. We're helping them with the job search. And a theme that keeps coming up for us is relationships. We offer up guidance and wisdom and hacks and tricks on how they can shorten their job search. But the first piece of advice that we give every single job seeker is when you're looking for a job, Who do you know that can help you get that job? I'm curious to know from your perspective, if you're going to embark on a job search or you're going to walk into a different career or multiple careers or take a chance on something, what is the one piece or a few pieces of advice that you could say, hey, look, this is time tested. This is what you should be doing as you embark on that inflection point in your career or your life. Well, I think you already touched upon it. One is relationships matter. In fact, I spoke to a guy this morning that I was on a board. I served on a board with him probably 15 years ago. We haven't spoken to since. I talked to him this morning. We remembered each other. We're helping each other on a deal. So it is often the case where you think, well, you know, I didn't make any friends there. But you do. You always develop relationships. And I talked once recently on LinkedIn about if your boss doesn't know your name, you're likely to get laid off. He doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know what you add. So relationships with your colleagues, relationships with your supervisors, relationships with all those around you are really important. The second thing that I would mention, and I think it's highly overlooked, is I would take risks with careers. That doesn't mean quit your job 
take two years off and then try to come back to the same job. I am suggesting that you should take risks in jumping into a job that might be a little bit over your head, jumping into a job that might be a little bit of a stretch, taking that assignment that might be out of town for six months in order to move ahead. As I've talked to people about careers and about you know the Never Say Whatever book, what I have found repeatedly are regrets are all about the decisions that you did not make, not the decisions that you made. And it turns into, I should have taken that promotion. I could have done that job. I would have been more successful. So don't get into this shoulda, coulda, woulda mindset. Take risks. So be relationship oriented and take risks when they come along because I've done that my whole career and don't have any regrets about that. Yeah, it's clearly paid off. I'm curious to know. So a lot of folks that we talk to a lot of folks who are listening today are earlier in their career and they're thinking, hey, look, all of these possibilities are ahead of me, even, you know, middle stage or even late stage. There's so many possibilities ahead of people when they're talking about careers. But I do also talk to those same folks who are really, really risk averse with things in their career. I'm somebody who is quite the opposite as well. I've always gravitated towards startups and new tech and venture backed businesses by nature. That's a little bit more risky than just working in a corporate environment. I'm curious to know for the type of person that wants to get into corporate, but also wants to take some of those risks, how do you open up possibilities for yourself? How do you be more risk taking without necessarily risking at all or the appearance of risking? You know, yeah. Is it just a, a frame of mind? Well, your listeners should know I was in consulting for a long time. I was a partner at Accenture. And often we would work as a consulting team, we would work with a team inside the client. And lots of times they would be seconded, they would be removed from their regular job to work with a consulting firm, which is a risk. I mean, that that was always a risk because they had to leave what was safe and comfortable and what they knew. So that's one I would suggest whenever a project comes along, whenever there's a consulting team being formed, whenever there's an internal task force, volunteer to do that. That it's a way to be visible. It's a way to make an impact without huge risk. But there is some risk because you know, might be more work or your job might be filled while you're on that task force. So if you're working for a large corporation, I would take risks by always being the person to volunteer. Now, if all your coworkers hate you for doing that, then that's a risk that you want to avoid. Don't be that person that everybody hates because he's always raising his hand and saying, I'll do that. I'll do that because they'll sabotage you. They'll hate you. And they'll, so don't be that guy, but be strategic about what risks you want to take inside. And I would suggest when you see Bain or McKinsey or Deloitte or Accenture or some any other big firm coming in and doing a project, work with them, help them. And I think that's a risk, but you don't know where that will go. So yeah, the fine line of not being a brown noser, the first person in the class yeah. to kind of raise their hand and get the, uh, yeah, you don't do room the teacher. Yeah. People know. But, and also I, I should warn everybody, consultants know, I mean, availability is not a skill. So if you're going to volunteer, you need to know something about what you're talking about. The consulting firms know who's going to be useful and who won't be. Super cool. Super cool. Very helpful. Great guidance. I'm curious to know what trends are you paying attention to more specifically with the job market? We've seen such a shoppiness, tumultuousness, like over the last, yeah. let's call it three and a half years, obviously sparked by COVID, but COVID full stop on the job market, then huge boom. And now we're in this tricky interest rates rising capital is is dwindling, you know, layoffs are coming type of environment. What are you paying attention to right now? Well, the return to work deal is first and foremost, and all the managers want you to return and nobody wants to go back. So it's a tricky arbitrage there, but I would be ultra sensitive to what is happening in your industry and what's happening in that world relative to returning to work. And I would sin on the side of returning to work. Let people know you develop those relationships. We've already talked about that. So first and foremost is the return to the office. I, I see that as something that's not going to go away and something we're going to have to navigate for a while. The other thing is, I think, how can I put this without using a lot of jargon about adding value or, you know, in this world today, I would pay more attention to your performance and your review. I would ask yourself every week, did I add anything this week? Did I add any, did I make the place better? And then so that when your review comes around, you can point to things that you did because supervisors are having a hard time figuring out what everybody's doing because they may or may not ever see you. So I would spend considerable time. My one piece of, I guess, career advice right now is keep track of what you do and recognize that how you add value, how you contribute 
is going to be really important, especially for younger people who are just starting out. Showing up is not a skill, but adding value is something that people are going to pay attention to. Yeah, really, really good advice. There's a saying in sales, right? With every interaction, you should be adding value, not just following up. So I love that. And it's great advice, a good framework for your career, good thing to follow for your career as well. I do want to touch upon, it comes up often on these shows, but when we talk about the return to work, I'm of two brains and it sounds like you have an opinion on it as well. We talk about it. My opinion is I would be a completely different human if in my first job or first jobs, I was not in the office constantly getting to know mentors, getting to know colleagues learning about how to just operate in the real world versus in the university setting. So at one end, I'm like, I'm all in on coming back to work. On the other end, I got two kids and the commute is brutal and I don't love spending, you know, an hour in the car every day. And sometimes it's just easier to stay at home, especially on days where I don't have, you know, team meetings or anything. So yeah, I have trouble, you know, balancing that. You have like a general recommendation or general guidance for our audience on like what they should be thinking when a boss says, hey, get back in the office. Yeah, I think your dilemma is one that everybody deals with right now. I like to be home too, but you know, the UPS guy is at the door, the plumber wants to fix our sprinkler system, the dogs are barking. I mean, sometimes it's easier to go to work, go into the office, but no one wants to deal with the commute. And the truth is when everyone started working from home, everyone got a raise because you weren't paying for gas, you weren't paying for parking, you weren't paying for car maintenance and commuting and tolls and things like that. So you want to keep that raise, but I would be ultra sensitive to what the culture is is if you're the only one not returning to the office, then you better find a different place to work. If you're the only one who's going into the office, then you need to ask yourself why. And then somewhere in between, I think good advice is to find out when everyone is in the office. Is it Tuesday? Is it Wednesday? Definitely not Friday. So find out when they're there, find out when your boss is there and show up. Showing up still does matter, but don't show up and then get on your headphones and look at your laptop all day. Go out to lunch, go out to coffee, talk to people, find out what's going on, sit in the conference room. I mean, talk to people. Don't just go into the office and be mad and sit in the bathroom all day because you're so irritated. If you're going to show up, build the relationships. That's my advice. Yes, yes, yes. Really, really good advice for our early career audience who's just developing those strong relationships that are going to hopefully span the test or the time in their career. Do you have a good framework or process to build relationships or nurture relationships that you build at work and bring them with you from job to job or stop along your career or even outside of the job into your personal life? Do you have a process to follow or even just a guide or is it just, you know, be a human? One thing I always tell people, no matter how miserable you are, don't burn the bridge. And if you're resigning from a job, you can do it in five minutes. You don't need to spend an hour telling them how screwed up they are. Say, it's been a great run. I'm resigning. See you later. And the same thing works if you're firing somebody. You don't need to tell them how great they are because it's too late. Say, here we are. You're terminated. Good luck. That's one. Just staying in touch with people, which is hard to do. It's really hard to do, but I would never, it's not about gossip. And there's also a Austrian word for jealousy that's called Schadenfreude. You know, I'm always, I hate it when you succeed, but I'm happy when you don't succeed. Don't do that. Just be a friend, be a relationship. You never know where everybody's going to turn up. I would always take the high road, you know, stay out of the trenches. You don't need to post your resignation letter on TikTok or LinkedIn. I can summarize my advice about careers in two words. That is, be selfish. Have yourself, your self-awareness. You just want to stay alert and do the best for yourself and your family. And be selfish sounds horrible, but I think I tell people to be selfish because if you're working at uh, Apple right now and you're thinking about resigning, Apple will do fine without you. So be selfish about what you're thinking about next. Yes. Great advice. You have to have your own back. No one's going to vouch for you. You have to be your best advocate all the yeah. time. I hear cutthroat a lot in an office environment, like yes and no. It's not necessarily cutthroat, but nobody's going to be looking out for you because they're looking out for themselves too. We are, are asking for things when they deserve that, right? And when they don't. 
And there is, you know, people say, well, I'm glad sort of like in high school, whoa, this is going to go on your permanent record. Well, there is a permanent record. It's everything you post, everything you say, it's out there. So be careful about that. I see people on LinkedIn or everywhere and I say, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done that. That could be career disaster. Makes total sense. And we're living in an era where you can very easily post whatever the heck you want. I want to ask one more question and I definitely want to get to your book before we head out. The last kind of question on career focus stop. So you had an opportunity while at Menlo to understand the good, the bad, the ugly of what college kids go through as they're moving out of a university environment into the workplace. I want to focus on that transition. What do you think is missing from where we are today as a university system that teaches this kind of general studies or general concepts and gives you a, a bunch of things to focus on, but not one path versus when you get to that first job, you are required to really just hit the ground running, expected to know how to succeed and really like expected to fly from day one. How do you kind of resolve that not conflict, but those two brains as you're heading out into that first role. It's a difficult transition. Part of what I talk about in the book, which we'll get to in a second, it's a good segue maybe, is one of the things that you're hit with as you're graduating from college is really big decisions all at once. What about my career? I studied accounting, but I hate accounting. Should I be an accountant? So you have a career decision. You have a geography decision. Where should I live? Should I go back home to Fresno or Nebraska? Or should I stay in Palo Alto? You also have lots of relationship decisions. What about this person I've been dating for the last two years who just took a job in Chicago? What do we do? So all these decisions all happen at once, which can be overwhelming. On the career side, my one piece of advice is to say, pay attention and don't settle. Try to do something that you want to do. There's a great video out now, Obama talking, giving somebody career advice about following their passion. And he said, you know, passions are good, but I'll tell you why you get a career. Pay the bills. You get a career to pay the bills. And I think they have to balance passion with paying the bills. So my advice is do the best you can is definitely not going to be your last job and hang in there because it gets better even though you're making all these big decisions all at once. Yep. Really, really great point. Something from him, baby, he's on a tour of some sort as well, but it was something like be the person or figure out how to get stuff done, right? Just yeah, figure that's right. Right. I saw that too. And, and he's right. Be the person who put people point to to get things done. Yep. Great, great advice. So I, I want to hear about the book. I'm excited about the title. I want to hear your perspective on it. You know, why'd you make it? What's it about? And what can people learn from sure. Never Say Whatever? It's a good segue from what we've been talking about, Danny, because there's not a lot of big decisions in our lives. There's 10, 15 big decisions at most, where you live, who you marry, things like that. So what I've discovered is I've always hated the word whatever. Every, whenever I hear it, it's like I cringe. But there's Cornell researchers have discovered that we make about 35,000 decisions every day. Big mm -hmm. decisions. They're small decisions. In fact, just right now, we've been making decisions as we go along about what we're going to talk about, about what you're going to ask me about all of that. So the point of my book is every time you say the word whatever, you're not making a decision, which means you're probably not going to get what you want. And when you say whatever, you also look like a slacker or a stoner or a loser. So the whole book is if you stop saying that word, whatever, you're going to be more successful and you're going to be happier. And I talk to leaders about it. I talk to people who have done research about it. So it's very simple. And your listeners, I hope even if they don't buy the book, if they stop saying whatever, they'll be more successful and happier. That's the whole book. So, but it talks about I also give tools about how you can make, how you can get out of the whatever world, use algorithms, use if then scenarios, use pros and cons, use the magic gate ball, turn it over and ask questions. It'll give you an answer. So the whole book is about simplifying decision making and recognizing that every time you say the word, whatever, you're not making a decision. So stop saying the word. I want to create an earwig in everybody's head. You know, you, I, I just heard whatever. In fact, I heard you say it before, buddy. I heard you say it. And uh -huh. um, so from now on, you're going to have the earwig. Every time you hear whatever, you're going to say, ah, I can't handle that. I need to hold up the imaginary stop sign in my mind every time yeah. it comes up. Yeah, that's it. I want that to be the case. 
I love that. I love that. There's a lot of apathy attached to that word. And um, apathy is, is not something that I admire. And it sounds like obviously you as well. Well, everybody should check this book out. I'm excited to read it as well. I want to ask you your one last formal question before we get you out of here. It's a question we've asked all our guests on all four seasons of the Ramp podcast. It's now that you have the benefit of hindsight, what would you tell yourself as you were entering into your career, knowing what you know now? I would say two things. The first is uh, it will be fine. It's going to work out. You don't need to stress out work. However it happens, we work it out. And the second thing is don't say whatever about your career. If you don't like it, don't do it. If you don't like the place where you work, look for another job. If you don't like your supervisor, move. I mean, so making decisions about careers is not about whatever. It's about saying, I need to make a change or I like this and I'm going to keep it. But don't say whatever and settle for something that you don't like. Those are my two pearls of wisdom on that front. It'll work out and don't say whatever. Really good advice, Rich, and a good way to segue out of here. An optimist by nature. Rich, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Our audience is going to love this episode. I loved chatting with you and I'm very, very excited to share the book with everybody and also uh, it'll be included on the show notes. But Rich, thank you so much. We hope to have you back someday on the Rap Podcast. Okay, Danny. Thanks.